Hey everyone, welcome to another exciting edition of the Fun and Victorious podcast. I am your host, Andy the Game Maker, and on today's episode, I interview Kurt, aka Uncivil Law, and we discuss how he came into becoming a lawyer, how he became very interested in intellectual property, patents, technology, and then eventually how he transitioned into becoming a YouTuber after uh, his all of his experience, his 15 years plus experience as uh, someone someone working in an in intellectual property as, as for, with, with the legal background. So without further ado, uh, I hope you enjoy this program. Oh, but before we do that, a quick message from our main sponsor. Are you surprised? Crypto Cartel is a two to eight player game where players must work to build up their own resources in order to accumulate as much cryptocurrency while playing through the main deck three times. Players earn the ability to earn cryptocurrency as they collect cards of similar types and then exchanging them during the game. Simultaneously, the cryptocurrency gives each player the ability to earn cards from the Silk Road deck. These cards give players the ability to attack their opponents, defend any impending attacks, or fend off the DEA. The DEA cards appear in the main deck during the second and third rounds of the game, forcing a player to give up their most valuable production line. You must develop production lines of multiple cards in succession as quickly as possible. And in order to do this, you must make effective trades with other players. But be careful, get too far ahead and everyone will go after you. To purchase your copy of Crypto Cartel, the game that I made, please go to my website at www.andythegamemaker.com and to go to my, my guests, social media links, just go to the description of this video and I hope you enjoy the show. Uh, great. Thank you so much for joining me here today on, on Fun and Victorious. This is a podcast program I've been doing for um, about six months now. Really grateful to have you on. Um, by the way, how was the, uh, the murder mystery dinner thing that you did uh, on, on YouTube of just last night? How did that go? Yeah, so one of the things I've been trying to do is look for ways to help engage people who are supporting the channel financially, try to find ways to give back to people who are helping me and accomplishing my goals. And so one of the things I did was one of these murder mystery games. So we had our first sort of playthrough last night and it went pretty well, all things considered. I think it was well received by our audience Good. and will be the thing we'll look for in the future. And I think we'll also look to do things that are similar, escape room experiences that are online and other things that are possible. We've done some Jackbox games but other things that will look for ways to provide some engagement and opportunity to build community and also find ways to support people who are supporting me. That's awesome. No, like, uh, the, the, and by the way, thank you so much for uh, inviting me onto the Jackbox event. Like, I thought like, the, was it the first of the year? On like, yeah. The, yeah, that was that was really fun. I, I pers I mean, I, 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 you know, enjoy trivia myself, but I guess uh, I also like getting creative with these answers where you try to figure out like how to like basically arouse people with like the, the, the things you say. So um, those are always really fun. Um, and then how are things? And you're in Austin, correct? I am in Austin, yes. Has Austin like really started to get really cold now? Or are you guys in Oh, heck no. No, it's, <laughs> it's, it's great outside. I can still go outside in a shirt if it's, it's sunny at the moment, yeah. Oh, cool, cool. You're not anticipating any massive uh, snowstorms rolling through anytime? In, not the next like month? last year. No, not so far. Oh, my goodness. Hopefully not. So, well, Kurt, again, thanks, thanks for coming on here. I really appreciate the time you gave me. Uh, and basically what I wanted to do is just use this as an opportunity to get to know you, who you are as, as uncivil law, and just learn how you came to be. So I guess a good way to start have this conversation is just to discuss your, your law background. So um, I take it you went to law school. Is that, is that safe to say? I did go to law school, yes. Yeah, so where did you go? I went to Akron. Okay. Are you originally from Texas or are you originally from Ohio? I'm not from none of those places. I was born in Pennsylvania, but grew up in South Carolina. 
Oh, wow. Oh, wow. You, oh, so you've seen a whole bunch of the country at this point in your life? Yes, I have. Oh, wow. Okay. So grew up in Pennsylvania and South Carolina. Wait, wait, so which, which you started in Pennsylvania and then moved to South Carolina? Yes. I okay. went to under, undergrad was Clemson University. And oh, wow. Which is outside of Greenville in South Carolina in the mountains. Right, right. Yeah. So you must have had some really good football experiences in Clemson alone. When I was going to Clemson, the Clemson football team was doing okay. We were yeah. winning half our games and going to bowls. We were crushing it like we are now. Yeah. But it's been fun as an alumni to watch. Yeah. Oh, for sure. It's kind of like, you know, um, with, with me, I was, you know, w- went to West Point. I was actually on the Army football team. And when I went there, it was just pretty miserable. But now it's completely different. It's, it's, it's great, you know, watching those games really lively and, and, and just, it's just, it's really fun to see Army just beat Navy. Like, like that, that was the one thing that was seriously lacking when I was there. Um, I've heard tell. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, but you would think rate, that Army would be better than Navy, you know, with the whole ground game thing, but, you know, whatever. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's, I think part of it's recruiting. I mean, it's, there's a myriad of factors that probably go into it. Um, it just depends on what you want to do. I mean, some people find, like, for example, the Navy SEALs, they'd be really, kind of a cool thing to do uh some people like you know you know going in the rangers battalion or one of the i don't, rangers I don't really fancy being sandy that much yeah <laughs> you know, that's not really for me <laughs> well that's i would say that, well it depends on what, what you mean by oh well, i guess i really can't think of a, a, a situation where you're sitting in the sand and it's like oh this is pleasant completely but then again no if i remember correctly when we when we were playing i descent you uh uh, beaches are pleasant was one of the questions if I remember correctly yeah and I went with beaches yeah. are bullshit yeah <laughs> yeah right yeah <laughs> that's that's right um but anyway so so Akron so how did you land on 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 Akron for uh grad school for for law school so Akron has a very good intellectual property program and it was a field I was interested in going to Akron is home of the National Inventors Hall of Fame and it uh has a very good intellectual property curriculum So it was a subject I was interested in studying uh, for my undergrad, which was computer science. So I was interested in how technology and law interface from a fairly fairly early age. I was interested in that field probably since late high school at the latest. Interesting. Okay. So Inventors Hall of Fame, that's really interesting. So what's what's in that Inventors Hall of Fame? Is it typically just people who literally like who just develop a lot of things or like what's... What is that comprise of? Well, yeah, it's it's a it's a museum slash um, testament to the great inventors of people who have come up with all kinds of interesting inventions that have made life better. So That's anything that has technological purpose that has improved our lives, which is a pretty long list. Interesting. Okay. So wait. So you have a, being that you have a technology background. Um, did you uh, and, and computer science were, were you interested in more go you know developing actual technologies at, at, at one point early early in your life is that what you no decided? I was always interested in law, oh, uh, law? The, 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 the computer science degree was to serve the law degree not the other way around okay interesting okay cool 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 that's oh wow that's that's really neat um, <clears throat> and, and just so you know I I, 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 I I do work in big tech for my my day job uh, I, I'm, I'm in cybersecurity for for my day job right now which is kind of I used to be better at that it's been a while. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's crazy because that's that's an evolving field. By it seems like by the hour, by the minute, just there's just so much stuff happening. But at any rate, because um, I, I know one of the things that people are, are typically um, one of the things that is usually a, a deciding factor for graduate school is is like the market you want to work in. So, um, how did you land from going from Akron, Ohio, to to Austin, Texas. That's I, I find that's a, a pretty interesting. Well, I was um, working in I was working in Northern Virginia, okay. and uh, for an employer which I still work for, and okay. I was recruited out of Ohio mm-hmm. to work for that employer, and uh, so I wound up taking the Virginia bar rather than the Ohio bar, and uh, worked in Virginia for thirteen years or so, and have been in Texas for two, give or take, something like that. Interesting. Okay. So, oh, so you're certified, uh, are, are, can you practice law in both Virginia and Ohio? No, I'm only licensed in Virginia. But Virginia. the nice thing about patent law, which is my field, is that it's a federal license. Oh. So I, I can pra- I can practice patent law anywhere because the federal government says I can. Oh, wow. Okay. And then so and then so how did you end up in, in I mean, if I'm not, I hope you don't mind me asking, how did you end up in Austin of all places? I just wanted a change of uh, okay. scenery, basically. 
and oh, I okay. had visited and kind of liked the city and figured why not give it a try. Oh, interesting. Okay. So yeah. So, cause I know one of the things um, I've learned with lawyers is typically once you get certified with, you know, once you, you take the bar, for example, in in California, you can only practice law in California yeah. unless, unless you go to DC, of course, and where it's a little bit easier to, to, I guess, pass that bar or become certified uh, within DC. But I guess with, with the federal uh, certification for, for um, patent law, it uh, gives you some, some wiggle, you know, significantly more wiggle room to basically work wherever you want. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know if it's totally unique, but it's, it's fairly rare. There's not many fields that really allow that kind of flexibility. If you're inside the military and right. performing law, then you typically can perform anywhere. If you're working as a federal prosecutor, you can kind of work anywhere on a federal license, but there's not very many of those uh, right. that exist. Uh, patent law, patent law is interesting in sort of its history going back to basically when the Venetians invented the concept in the 15th century. It's always been a sort of an interesting field of law it started off basically with non-lawyers. It started off with the technology people because the technology aspects are more important than the law because you have to understand the technology principally. And so it's also, a, 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 I think it might be a unique field of law because it's a field of law that you don't need a law degree to practice in. You do need a technology degree, but you don't need a law degree. So you can, you can, get, a law, like you can get a license to practice in patent law without a law degree. It's, it's, so it's unique in that respect as well. Oh wow, interesting. Okay. Oh, so 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 you do need the the, the computer science degree in order to be a patent lawyer. Is what yeah, you need some sort of technological undergrad. So engineering, chemistry, computer science, stuff that is provides practical um, technological utility. Uh, so it's not it's not even all sciences necessarily. It's one that would have sci uh, practical utility in the real world so manufacturing and invention of new things interesting interesting okay so but there's no and and because that's what's really interesting with like um what i've learned with lawyers is that you don't necessarily and then i'm not sure what how this applies to like you know patent law like what, like what you're describing but i know for example like you don't necessarily need to go to law school in order to become a lawyer ultimately at the end of the day um, there are a couple exceptions, but primarily you do. And especially yeah. if you want to have any ability to transfer your license, if you do the other routes, you're going to be really stuck. Okay. Interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then what's, um, as far as like what you've learned, like, um, at least easing into this type of uh, career with, you know, being in the, in the patent law, like what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned along the way going from graduate school to actually practicing patent law? I don't know the 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 field is much more technological than legal in a lot of respects. It, it, it's uh, the law is less volatile or less um, less a factor than the technological elements. So in patent law, you're trying to figure out whether or not an invention is new. So just to put you know a, to make it easier for people maybe to to imagine, you can imagine any kind of technology you want, like maybe a microphone in front of you, right? Right. So. There are different or or the camera we're watch, we're doing on. So there's different ways to to do a camera. There's different technological methods, right? And those can be fairly big or fairly small. It can be a new way of de designing a lens out of new materials. It can be a new way of securing the lens to the body of the thing. It can be a new way of of the switches being designed or or the software interfaces or the algorithms. So, or for a microphone, it can be the different kinds of hardware or different kinds of materials. So basically anything that prevents a, provides a technological development. So it can be fairly small components. Another way of thinking about it is if you're thinking of like a car engine and what you're looking at, it could be anything from the car engine itself to fairly minor components, like the nature of the valve or how it's constructed yep. or, the nature of an ignition coil or a ejector or you know how these things are designed or how to how to inject fuel in the middle of a compression cycle or in the middle of a piston which was a right. which was a design challenge for a long time i think it was they didn't crack that one until relatively recently figuring out how to put uh fuel in between two pistons that are coming at each other and put it in the middle um, to figure that out. That was, I think, done finally by Subaru or Honda, something like that, a couple mm -hmm. years back. Right. But all kinds of technological discoveries, which may or may not be ultimately better than what exists. But then again, you don't know when you're starting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's, um, I, I know that there is what's really um, interesting in, in my field. I'm trying not to give away too much information, but 
who I work for, but, um, but basically all the things that I've seen along the way um, with, with, with respect to with the cybersecurity, for example, is just because there are so many different types of threat vectors, because I mean, there's like new technology every single day. So for example, like the, the Apple watch came out, like, you know, what, five, ten, ten, was it five years ago, roughly give or take. Um, it, it seems, I don't know, times, times, you know, it seems to be falling much quicker now that I have kids, but, but basically because there are so many more threat vectors that, that are, are coming about, it's, I mean, you, there's a way more opportunity to, to create more technology, you know, create more patents for different things, for, for different types of utility, um, to, to keep things safe. So, um, yeah, yeah. It's, so uh, here's a question for you. I, I know like one of the things that I've always really wondered about is like, like, for example, um, like how, like what, what we do as, a, as, you know, Americans with respect to countries like China that mm -hmm. are consistently mm -hmm. stealing technology. So for example, you hear those stories about like the, those Apple stores out there that are like not really Apple stores, but they're selling like, you know, the, these fake iPhones. I mean, like what's, what's your perspective from, from like a patent lawyer? And that this is kind of a general question, but like, what are some of the issues or what are some of the, the obstacles that you deal with uh, when you hear about stuff like that? I don't have any particular issues in my practice, because my my practice is U.S., I don't mm -hmm. quite have international yeah. credentials. Um, right. So I don't. First of all, the U.S. is a major market. So yeah. even if our stuff is being ripped off in China, it it's a problem in terms of that stuff being sold in China. But once you have patent protection in the United States, uh, to the degree the U.S. government is able to do it, and God knows they spend enough effort to detect yeah. counterfeits and other things like that, you can prevent importation of any infringing goods. Uh, which increases reliability of getting authentic products in the United States because of efforts trying to police that to try to ensure that authentic stuff comes in. Of course, it's not a guarantee, right? Um, because there's a lot of incentive to try to cheat, but right. there's you know we there's a lot of effort. But the United States is a major market. The companies have incentives to play within the rules because it's such a huge market, and you know so the big the big companies don't really have any incentive to cheat because. You know, they're, there's, they're, they're playing by the rules. It's, it's not that burdensome and it gives you all this wonderful protection. You know, it's a big, it's a big guarantee. We give, you tell us how to do, that. this is the whole exchange, right? Right. You tell us how to build the thing. Right. Because that's what we want, right? This is, whole, it's all about discovering new technology to promote the useful arts as the constitution puts it. So in order to promote the useful arts, which is another way of saying technology, that's how they phrased it in the 18th century, useful arts. Um, but in order to promote the useful arts, we are giving you a monopoly. So you tell us how to make the thing. We give you a monopoly for a limited time period. Now we know how to make the thing so other people can make the thing. And right. then we've increased the, we've increased the knowledge base. Other, I think ultimately what will drive other countries to be more respective about their own policies is wanting protection and cross-national protection because as china continues to develop right. it has it will it will have incentives uh, that it, that are already in place and in, are growing to want to protect its own intellectual property so it will almost necessarily have to develop mechanisms to fuel that growth because who will invent something in china if it can be ripped off easily in china right so there's the, the driving force from purely selfish perspectives for the, because if you don't provide the protection, people don't have incentive to innovate. Right. So that's the whole, there's an incentive for China to ultimately want to provide further protections for its own inventors and technological growth. And I think to a large degree, you're seeing that happen already. It's certainly not what it once was. And I think the directions are going in favor of greater recognition of the value of the intangible intellectual properties and protecting those all together that, that's yeah that's good to hear um interesting and of course ultimately it becomes an issue of cross-national policy it becomes an issue of the the china's ability to play on the world market with other countries ultimately it's an issue of you know uh diplomacy an issue of transnational agreement you know the degree right. to which we want to play nicely with others exactly yeah I, I i always worry about china just because i always feel like it's a, we i mean just from the u.s perspective we have a very asymmetrical relationship with them where we do a lot of things for them but they don't always reciprocate um with with some of the things that we do um i mean like we you know obviously we'll we'll, we'll go and like you know make these you know for example we'll go to you know china and film a disney movie right <laughs> and then meanwhile like it's it's like hey you you know, we, and we kind of like turn a blind eye to all the human rights stuff that's happening 
you know, right under our noses when they're making, making the movie. And it just seems to me, it's just like, they just don't really care about like, <clears throat> or, 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 or don't seem to really um, have any interest in actually hearing. I mean, like we don't even talk about it. I mean, as, as soon as someone mentions anything about it, like for example, John Cena, you know, recognizes Taiwan, right? Um, <laughs> he immediately goes and says, oh, you know, Taiwan's not really a country basically. And, 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 and his really, you know, horrible broken Mandarin, if you will. Um, any, any comments on that or no? I mean, not the particularly that goes to a lot larger issues and ultimately depends on how you want to address those issues. The, um, I think that there are mechanisms for economic drivers to create cooperation. I think one of the reasons that, um, you know, it's been said before, the free, free trade stops wars. Right. Um, one of the you don't go to war with countries that you're trading with, mm -hmm. and yeah. and the the economic incentives can provide reasons for cooperation. So right. I think China's position is more of a medium to long term issue than a short term issue. Right. It's something that the United States needs to pay attention to, mm -hmm. but China has its own issues. So it's you know. You're trying, and I think that there's, what are the, you know, this ultimately goes back to whether or not Nixon was right to open up trade to China in the first place. Was that yes. ultimately a correct idea or not? Mm -hmm. And goes back to how, how do you try to influence other nations' policies and the degree to which that has or has not been successful is debatable. And I don't know that there's any right answers to these questions. Um, there was a great line on the West Wing around, along those lines where there's like, you know, there's no right answers to these questions. Diplomacy needs all the words it can get its hands on. Oh, geez. Oh, man. A great, great little quote from uh, the assist, uh, fictional assistant secretary for commerce. <laughs> who's like, you know, in the, in the Mang dynasty, they, they buried they, the, the lucky ones were beheaded. The unlucky ones were buried alive. So, you know, oh, people geez. sewing soccer balls with their teeth. This is progress. Oh so it's like, goodness. well, there's there's something to be said about that too, I guess. Oh my gosh, I, like that the line of uh, diplomacy needs as many words as it can get. That's just like, um, yeah. I, I just can't help but think about uh, Edward Bernays um, and, and propaganda. That, that's a, that's a, one thing that comes to mind immediately. Um, but at any rate, um, what I wanted to ask you as well is, so say for example, so some of, some of the people who listen to my program are also people who are interested in small business and looking to get into sure. um, technology get, and develop things. What types of advice can you give to those people who are really interested in, in, in innovating and looking to, you know, make a difference, for example, in, in, in the, the technological market with all the opportunities out there? Well, I think that there's, the one thing is that there's so much opportunity in all kinds of fields and there's all kinds of, I mean, if you think about the, the patent arts, go into every technology known to man, things that you've thought about and things you probably haven't thought about. They, they still, they're still, there's still a whole classification dealing with coffins. Just as a random example, is like my personal favorite go-to example for some reason. Yeah, there's a whole technology classification <laughs> for the coffins because people are still inventing new ways of doing coffins and, and new ways of doing burials, new ways of doing all kinds of things. Uh, the, 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 another one of my favorite go-to examples is the, the, the can, the can sodas and yes. how the, the long ones, how they have that flap, you uh -huh. know, that opens up. I mean, mm -hmm. that flap was patented. Someone invented that. Right. And it was amazingly successful. So you can have technology growth and technology development in something as simple as the flap on a, on a can, on a, on a thing, and it can be hugely successful. So the first thing I think of is technology influences every aspect of your life in because by technology we don't necessarily mean electronics mm -hmm. we don't necessarily mean computers technology can be purely mechanical there's still new ways of designing screws there's new ways of designing glass there's new ways of designing you know pick your pick your thing of choice here right. the chemical arts in particular i mean there are new ways of developing all kinds of plastics new kinds of plastics new kinds of biotech so the uh, the amount of in innovation that's possible is essentially infinite mm -hmm. and there is ways to develop that technology so first thing is i guess you have to figure out what you want to be so recognizing the market market opportunity is obviously one thing that has to be done and the other thing is just like trying to develop the technology and trying to you know try a thousand things until something works right and then patents can be a useful part of that one of the nice things about patents is because it's a kind of property, it becomes an asset 
that you can leverage against. So you can get mm-hmm. loans against it. You can get, you can get, you can sell it as a as an asset. So it becomes something that is of value to a company. Right. And um, so there's, you know, there's a reason that there's a reason that there's, you know, people are filing new pens every day. There's a reason that the pen and trademark office, I think, is 700,000 applications behind. It's not because they're lazy. They keep hiring more people and the people do more work faster. You can look at the statistics. So they're hiring more people and the people are doing more work than ever per person. And they're still behind because they can't they can't keep up uh, because of the amount of innovation. And there's no end in sight because technology is continuing to grow in basically every domain. That's a really crazy statistic. 700,000 applications behind. I mean, how does that, um, how does that make you feel? I mean, I, that, that's, that, that seems to be a very optimistic statistic if you, if you think about it in the bigger scheme of things. I mean, if, if there's that many people out there who are willing to push that many patents, I mean, that, it, it just goes to show you like how, how, I guess, how active the market has been in terms of just creating, wanting to create new technology. I mean, it's, that's, I mean, what, what, are your, what are your thoughts on that? No, no particular thoughts. I just think it goes to show that there is obviously value out there to be had and people are right. recognizing the value. And there's, you know, if you, if you get that patent protection, I don't know if you've ever watched an episode of Shark Tank yes. or, or its equivalents like mm-hmm. Dragon Den, but it's not exactly <laughs> uncommon to ask you, hey, do you, have any, uh, yeah. do you have any exclusive rights to this? Do you have a patent? Right, 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 right. Yeah. Like, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a fairly valuable asset. Or it can be in some circumstances, of course. It depends on what its underlying value of the thing is. So, right, right, patent, right. Patent, one of the sort of uh, things that I sort of get annoyed with is all the infomercials that say, and this got a United States patent. Well, depending on how you wrote it, you know, it may not be, it, you can get a patent easily that's not worth very much, right? Right. It's like you can get one that's very narrow. You can, I can get you a patent today. If all you want is a patent, I can get you one today. It won't be of any value, but you know, I can get you it. So you can say patent approved. That's, you know, that's not what the, the patent office is only trying to ask questions about the technological novelty or non-obviousness. Right. Whether or not it's good is not a question the patent office is trying to answer. In fact, if you can prove it's stupid, that goes a long way to showing it's not obvious now, isn't it? Like yeah. no one would do this because it's so dumb. Hey, it must be non-obvious. Yeah, so right, hey, right. there you go, right? True, true. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you, you sing, oh, if you want a patent, I can get you a patent today. It just reminds me of the line from the Big Lebowski. Oh, if you want a toe, I can get you a toe today. Like, like that. Well, by today, I mean like two years from now, but you get the point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so what are, I mean, like, uh, what are some of the issues that you see people run into um, from a legal perspective with a, with a patent, if you don't mind sharing? I mean, are there any moments where you're like, man, this is, uh, you know, this is a good lesson for this person. Um, this is worthwhile maybe sharing for people who want to, you know, break into you know, patents? Well, the number one thing is you definitely want to, you definitely want a, a lawyer or a patent, patent attorney or patent agent filing it for you. I, I think, I think, I think the people, who, <laughs> I think the people who, you yeah, know, don't call me. I have enough work as it is. Um, but um, the people who try to go it alone, it, it doesn't end well. Um, patent, I mean, even the U.S. Supreme Court has called patent law I, I th- like one of the most difficult fields because it's this technical, you're trying to describe something technologically in legal language. And then sometimes that stuff is abstract on top of it. So for example, I deal with computer arts. So I'm dealing with software, which, you know, doesn't really physically exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, so right. I'm trying to describe something technological that is itself abstract in legal language that is abstract in a way that is going to be protectable. Right. So fun. Um, mm-hmm. you, and some people try to go it alone. It's, it's a massive mistake and, uh, you definitely want to, you definitely want to work with a professional and be, and then, then the other thing is just becomes a question of patience for one. And it becomes an issue of trade-offs because, if, well, you can look at this from a couple different ways. You can look at from this from a patent grant perspective or a patent being upheld in court perspective. And there's right. different analysis to be held there. So, I mean, these are complicated questions. There's a reason that patent lawyers, you know, are paid the rate they are there. There's a complicated trade-offs on a whole number of levels. Right. Interesting. Okay, cool. And then um, if you mind me asking, so like um, how is it that you um, ultimately ended up wanting to dive into YouTube as a, as a, law, as a law tuber, so to speak? So my, I'm, I've always been interested in law and 
Although apparent law has been good to me in a lot of ways, it is more technological than legal, which has not been my my primary driver and sort of my own curiosity. My my curiosity is much more in the legal aspect. And patent law doesn't have as much what you might consider churn in the legal aspects as it does in other fields of law. The the asp the issues that are debated in patent law tend to be much more rooted in the technological elements than the actual law as such. Um, so the the legal aspects are not typically what are creating the issues. What well, the reason I got into LawTube is because of my interest in law. And also at the risk of seeming immodest, at after I've been doing patent law for as long as I've been doing it, which is almost 15 years now, mm -hmm. I know my field of law. There's nothing left for me to learn there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I understand everything. And so I don't find it intellectually engaging mm -hmm. in sort of that way. So one of the nice things about my channel and one of the reasons I cover basically everything except patent law on my channel is because, well, first of all, I don't find patent law that interesting to talk about anymore. <laughs> and second of all, it's an opportunity for me to learn something new. Right. So I have over, I think I have over 1,100 videos on this channel at this point. And I think there might oh, be wow. one, there might be one, maybe two that talk about patent law and that entire thing. Because it's just not something I find very interesting. Oh, wow. um, I much rather talk about basically everything else. It's an opportunity for me to learn about other fields of law and and learn about other disciplines that are interesting. Interesting. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I think what's um, it's really fascinating. Obviously, I, I've you know coming from the perspective from, from my sister who's um, who who got into law tube about a little bit more than a year ago at this point, and just watching her and then just kind of slowing see, seeing like you and Nate kind of come in the picture, and then eventually all these other lawyers are coming in there and just like where where are all these lawyers coming from on on, on YouTube? It's, it's it's really funny. It's been really remarkable watching. Um, all of this that t take place, especially with the Rittenhouse trial. But you, but how long have you been doing uh, YouTube for now? Today depends a little bit how you count it. But I've been doing it seriously for about two years. Two years, okay. And there oh, were some uh, false starts before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that's that's like with any any I guess um, endeavor, ambitious endeavor like yeah. YouTube or any or any or like a, a small business that you're trying to make into a bigger business. That's the way I kind of look at. This. Well, it was a lot of me trying to figure out if it was something I wanted to do at all for a while. For sure. Yeah. Just testing the waters, just trying to see if it makes sense. Yeah. You can get the return on investment, which I totally understand. But 1,100 videos, that's, that's, uh, that's actually really impressive, Kurt. Um, I mean, like, so is this a lot of like, I guess, what's the balance between like the live streams versus just like independent editorial like videos, if you had to say? Um, maybe half and half these days. Yeah. Uh, I typically film or I have been filming on like a Sunday or something where I film a whole bunch of stories for later daily releases. So yesterday mm -hmm. I filled a whole bunch of stories for later releases that I have to still edit and release, but I do a fair amount of live streams too when something interesting happens. Right. Um, fortunately there's new stuff happening all the time in law. Sometimes it's a little hard to keep up with it all. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it moves faster than I did, uh, than I can. Right. I still have my day job. So I never got around to doing the U S Supreme court case oral arguments interesting, for the yeah. vaccine mandate. Oh, it's yeah. like, well, now, geez, the Supreme Court's already decided the issue. Do I, do, can I still go back and do the oral arguments? I guess it's just kind of lame now because we already know the answer. Yeah. But, you know, so I was like, eh, what can you do? For sure. Yeah. I mean, at this point, there's like, what, like, at least like, um, there's almost like a dozen of you that I know of off, off the top of my head, I think, at the, like all these different lawyers. Yeah. And at least half of them have probably already covered uh, anything related to the mandate. So it seems like the conversation has been exhausted. Um, but it's been really great. I, I think personally, um, it's been, I, I personally have enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, and I know you've made some, um, you're not the only one who's done this, but you made some videos kind of calling out legal Eagle. Um, I, I, I guess what's been like when you, when did you first learn about legal Eagle and, and what, uh, what's been like your impression of him over time? So I'm not sure when I first learned of legal Eagle, the, one of the very early videos I did on my channel was a review and discussion of his, a video that he did discussing Captain Marvel, which mm. still drives me a little bit up the wall because <laughs> of how bad it was. So he does this whole analysis about the Dawn coming up to Captain Marvel and touching the map and whether or not the Captain Marvel can do all these horrible, horrible things. And it's like a woke interpretation of law. It's so bad. It drives me crazy. Right. And so that uh, that video is very early in my channel. I think it's so old. Yeah. When I first started, I was going by the name Internet Law Review. So some of my earlier stuff, it still like goes under that name. If you go far enough back, 
Um, but yeah, it was definitely back when I still was using the old name and just, yeah. So there's, there's stuff like that. Uh, some of his stuff recently has been fairly surprisingly good. Right. When he did I'm... his analysis of Judge Schroeder, I'm 12 minutes into the video and I'm like, wait a second, this is a good video. I remember someone, watching that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and someone in the comments, someone in the comment made a very brilliant observation. It's like uncivil law sees the bait. And he's trying to find the switch. And so, you know, I was like, that was basically how I was feeling the whole time. I got to the end. I'm like, well, I don't have to tell you. This has the seal of approval from me. So it's yeah. like, it's a good video. So I don't know what to say. But you know what, though? That's, that's to your credit. Because I think a lot of people that look at stuff, I, I think that's a problem with most people. Is that um, one of the one of my, my, my comments is I think um, that one of the worst religions in the world is the, the, the two-party political system. And the reason why, you know, I, I, I say stuff like that sometimes, it's, it's mostly just to kind of like, um, um, it, it's more of a provocative statement than anything else, as you, as you could probably tell. But, the, but really what it comes down to is people fall for that, that false binary so often that they, they, they just totally turn off their, their ability to observe facts for what yeah. they are and just accept them for what they are. Or, and to your credit, you know, you're watching this video. And I, I remember watching this because I saw like your first one. Uh, about Rittenhouse and you're laying things out like you know oh, why yeah. is he trying to hide the ball with with Kyle Rittenhouse and then the second one with Judge Schroeder it's like where's is, is that legally <laughs> like 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 whose video am I watching right now yeah and, exactly um, so yeah, yeah and and um and it's it's actually been really fun watching and for, for those who are are listening and for those watching this video I I strongly recommend watching Kurt's videos because um for someone like me who is not who's otherwise not legally engaged in any way, shape or form, has no legal background by any means. Um, I, I actually have learned a lot. Like for example, a, a small example is like, like good facts versus bad facts. That's something I, I didn't, I, no. I you know, learned, learned by watching your videos. Another one was uh, Mensa Rea, where it's like basically you, you, you for example, the, the example you gave was you're in, you're in a diner somewhere and you grab an umbrella, you think it's yours, but it's not really yours, it's someone else's. Um, it, it's not that you intended to take that person's umbrella. It's just you reasonably thought that that was, it was someone else's, or you th th thought that was your um, umbrella. And so uh, uh, small things like that, I think make a huge difference. And I think you guys have done a really good job. And I think, um, yeah. what's been, uh, do you have anything out of that? No, <laughs> no, I, I, I do make a, a, a very strong effort on my channel to try to be as fair as possible. And sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like I, well, this is less a problem now, but it was definitely a problem earlier on where I felt like I wasn't getting credit uh, for being, you know, trying to be fair. Uh, for example, I was covering this whole Katie Joy Paulson versus Toddy Westbrook case. Uh -huh. And I would say really, you know, my first video was saying re nice things about Katie Joy Paulson, who has somewhat of a negative reputation, it seems, right. on the internet. And mm -hmm. so people were saying, oh, you're in the bag for her, you're in the thing, you know, you're biased or you're a shill. And so the yes. very next video, I'm doing a review of Katie Joy Paulson's thing. I'm like, well, I'm going to be really, really critical of this so the chat can decide who am I a shill for now. Uh, that kind of thing. Um, right. Or... The Vic Mignona case has been another one where I was critical of the filings for Vic Mignona and Nick, Nick Rakita's chat was having none of it for a very <laughs> long time. And then I said really nice things about Nick Rakita's amicus briefs. It had problems technically. Yeah. Uh, so it, I had problems on the other end. And then I got blasted by law Twitter for saying nice things about, you know, Rikita. Nick, who Nick was trying to say nice things about Vic. I'm like, I'm just trying to analyze the stuff before me, guys. It's just... I don't care. I just yeah. want to try to figure out what the answer is. And uh, so along those same lanes, it's, it's like legal, legal. If, if I think that he got something right, I'll say you got something right. You know, it's why, why not try to just give the honest assessment and hope people give you credit for trying to be honest. Yeah. You, you know, it's really interesting is that um, I, I, I feel like one of the issues that all you law tubers, I mean, I think YouTubers in general have to deal with is sometimes when you put something out there and the audience doesn't really like it um, on a regular basis. And it's, it could just be very easy. And I think it's maybe what separates you, for example, from, for example, from uh, like legal Eagle and those types Yeah, yeah. Uh, for the most part is that you try not, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I mean, it, it appears as though based upon what you're saying, based upon like um, what, what I'm seeing in my own observations is that you're not always trying to pander towards, towards what, 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 what the chat as, uh, as Nick likes to say, oh, yeah. Um, and that can, can obviously turn into some really, uh, I'm sure it's frustrating some moments, other, other times it can be kind of comical and, and, and how stupid it is. 
It can um, be comical. This this was happening to me like a couple days ago. I think it was Friday that the Supreme Court came down with its OSHA decision, right? Right. And so I'm reading the reading the majority decision, and I'm like, well, you know, I agree with the majority's overall conclusion, <laughs> but I don't I don't agree with the majority's reasoning here. I don't think yeah. that this I don't think this reason works. And I don't think this reason works. And I go to the dissent and I'm like, you know, I think the dissent has the better argument here. I think that this argument is more persuasive, yeah. or whatever. And I'm just getting so much and so much back shot <laughs> from my own stuff. He's like, you're wrong. You're a moron. You're all the rest of it. Just getting all this criticism. And so at the end, uh, at the end, I'm like, I don't understand why you're giving me such stuff. It's like, do you really need me to to come out here and just pan everything that they say you just need me to come out here and say oh she's completely wrong none of this makes any sense i can't believe how far the descent has its head up its ass yeah. and you're not gonna be happy and their chat's like yeah yep yeah, yep yeah. i'm like well that's just not happening i don't know what to tell you i don't i don't agree with the i don't agree with this reason this reason this reason this reason i find persuasive this is the reason that works for me here's my analysis of why that reason works so i'm with the majority as a concurring opinion and i don't know what to tell you that's just how it is what do you want it's just like nuance is dead. I feel like nuance it's, is dead. Yeah, that's the problem. It, it it's the same with chat. It's the same with uh, I'm not not saying with chat, but that, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about chat, but that also like social media, like nuance is is very much dead in, in social media. Like once once you say anything like remotely that goes against the grain, people like will will re revolt on you, and it's just it's just not really pretty. Um, and I, I want to ask you because um obviously I. Um, not, not, not to, not to, you know, stroke your egos or, or, or like, you know, um, I don't build mind. You up. Yeah. <laughs> but like what I think what was really, um, astounding was, um, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this. I feel like, well, let me ask you this. Are, are you familiar with the phrase, um, information feudalism by chance? Not particularly, but yeah. So information, yeah. So information feudalism, the first time I ever I heard that term was from, um, someone who I think is, is, uh, I, incredibly smart is uh dr james Lindsay. i'm not sure if you know who james Lindsay is so he coined uh, at least the first time i heard it was on one of his podcasts he talked about information feudalism and the way we kind of um well, well we're, we're, the sources of where we get like for example the, the the media the corporate press mainstream media all the all the news all the current events we're, like where we do that um and i i feel like what, what's really great about what you guys are doing is you're, you're very much disrupting um, said information feudalism. I think the Rittenhouse trial was a really great example of that. And because I, I, I can't, I, <laughs> how, I can't. How, how much, how much shit did I get during the Rittenhouse trial for saying nice things about yeah. Binger? It's like, geez, you know, I think this opening argument was really good. I think that, you know, I think that this was, I think this was a really good moment. How much crap <laughs> yeah. did I get for saying anything positive? Right, right, about right. Binger or saying, you know, I think Richards is really blowing it here on these yeah. objections. I don't, I don't understand what's going on here. Who this right. is? It's this opening is horrible. I'm falling asleep during it. And right, right, right. You know, and the, the funny thing is, I I ultimately agree that Kyle Rittenhouse should be found not guilty. Mm -hmm. I was persuaded long ago, but yeah, heaven right. forbid I say anything nice at all. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, this is my honest assessment. What do you want? I guess what you For want sure. me to do is just tell him you full is completely full shit. It's not my opinion. What it's like, I don't know what to do here. It's, no, 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 no. It can be frustrating sometimes. <laughs> no, but I, I think a lot of you were like that for the for the most part. A lot of you were. were I mean, um, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is the fact that we. I, I can't think of a time where there was a court case that was streamed the way it was on Ricada's channel. A whole bunch of you were on it, and I think what was really fantastic about it was the fact that you got all were calling balls and strikes as ever happened in real time. And I really can't think of a moment in in in, in U.S. history where anything like that has ever happened. Um, as, as it was happening in court. Um, and I think that there's a lot that, that um, you offered to the American public, you know, collectively. Because I, I think, like, you, you all were on there. Like, Riqueda got, like, as many as, like, a 120, 130,000 viewers at a time yeah. um, during, during, this, during this trial. And you guys were just, were all, I, I, you guys were all just being, you know, just calling it for what it was as things were happening. And just really changing the game and like what, what are your thoughts like how do you look back on the rittenhouse trial and what, what you all were doing as as, as, a, as a collective law to community well i thought it was great having a lot of different people come in and different people trying to analyze it and we're all trying to push each other up i i, I do like the feeling of talking to other professionals right in my field because we all have a common baseline right. knowledge mm -hmm. that we can all rely on and it's you know, I'm sure that you could understand it just by being in your own field. It's like there's right. a whole bunch of things you don't have to explain 
because you just are rely, you, relying on that. So someone says something and you're like, I know that they're working from this foundation. So it just makes it communication a lot easier and faster. And I just enjoy the feeling of having my intellect push, pushed up. Um, I also enjoy being challenged from time to time. Um, Natalie, the lawyer check did a good video in response to um, the, the verdict with the Kim Potter case. Right. And I, you know, I still don't know whether or not I agree with her or not, to be honest, but I appreciate the challenge right. of, you know, maybe there were some things that we weren't seeing. Mm -hmm. And the, the jury obviously saw things we weren't seeing, apparently. So there's that. Mm -hmm. So I do appreciate, you know, whether or not I ultimately will wind up agreeing or disagreeing or maybe just continuing having no particular opinion. Right. I do appreciate being challenged and having people um, push me when I feel like they are talking about something they know something about because it, re it causes me to reevaluate and hopefully makes me better for the next time. And it's one of the reasons I like going on the panels with Alita and Nate and Nick and other people from the law too, because they think about things differently, see things differently. And it causes me to try to make sure that my own thinking is as squared away as it can be. Right. No, that's, that's, that's great. Um, I, I think, I think what's really good about all that stuff is I think, I think you guys are doing a really good job of, of showing what healthy discourse looks like, especially mm -hmm. when you all disagree. Um, and I think that's really valuable because a lot of people don't know how to take disagreement nowadays. Um, I, I think, um, I think most people are just so, um, sensitive to this all, excuse me. Um, I think people are just so, so sensitive to what's going on that they, um, it, it's really hard for them to, to truly like, um, appreciate like what's like how to, how to take new information, how to assess it and, um, and try to reassess their own position is to find their own, find their own gaps in knowledge to find their own, their own blind spots, if you will. So, um, so, so, so good on you on all of you for doing that. I, I think it's really cool. What are some of the big lessons that you learned from the written house trial? I, I don't know. I guess the only sort of, lesson that i was re-exposed to was because one of two things has to be true either binger believes in what he's saying or he doesn't mm -hmm. um if he doesn't believe in what he's saying and that he's just doing it for some sort of personal gain or right. or political gain then it's disturbing that that's true if he does believe it then it goes to show, I suppose, how different people's perceptions can really be and goes to show how much I have to potentially open my own thinking to possibilities that were, were outside of my range. Because I'm like, if, if you can legitimately get to where you're saying that you are, then I didn't even consider that as a possibility. And so I have to... I don't know, challenge myself to try to figure out what is going on in that thinking so that I can open my mind up to other possibilities. So I suppose there's, that's the one thing that I sort of take away from the whole experience. Interesting. Yeah. Cause, um, that reminds me of, of a really good, good quote that I, I, I heard, um, like two months ago, I was listening. I, do you, do you listen to Lex Freeman's podcast podcast by chance? No. Are you familiar with him? Not particularly. He's actually local. To, I, actually, you might like him because he's one. He's local to Austin. Um, two, he's an MIT researcher. Um, okay. So he's heavily into technology, innovation. All basically, he's 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 like, hey, Kurt, check this out. But unless, <laughs> provided you're not exhausted of of IP stuff out in technology already mm -hmm. as it is. But um, one of the things he says that uh, part of being humble is accepting the, the possibility that you might be wrong about something. And I think that that's, yeah. that's, that's really interesting. Um, are there any particular lessons you learned as, as a law tuber from the whole Rittenhouse trial from that perspective? I, I guess I was surprised at how many people were truly interested. It was, it was and continues to remain a surprise that you had 100,000, 130,000 people at some point watching all this commentary. Mm -hmm. And we were blowing out 
basically everybody. Yes. And sometimes I think everybody combined at some point. And it's like, how, how is this a thing that's happening where, where this, you know, we had 15 people maybe going through that at various points uh, with 10 of us on screen at any given time. And how is this a thing where you got 10 lawyers trying to dissect this so that there's an appetite for whatever that was. And right. so it reaffirms to me that there is a role for me as a teacher, I, I do enjoy teaching. I do enjoy trying to explain this stuff and I enjoy thinking about the stuff. And right. I, uh, in some ways I've enjoyed the academic aspects of law more than the practice of law. I enjoy mm -hmm. the intellectual exercise of the, of the learning and teaching process uh, more than its practical application, but it's been very rewarding uh, in, in my own education. I'll tell you what's true. I've gotten more education from LawTube than I ever did through any of the continuing legal education stuff that I'm required to take in order to keep my law license. Interesting. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been very informative and more, more pragmatically useful than anything that uh, I would have had to take otherwise. That's really interesting. I, I, I feel like that's, um, I don't know, like, like, I feel like that's mostly true with just, I don't know, like, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is, like, here's a really good example. So, like, you know, I was in the Army, right? I was an Army officer. I learned a lot in my one year that I deployed uh, in Iraq, uh, more so than I did, like, in, in, in most other uh, instances of my life, just about by being in, in, in the trenches, so to speak. And I feel like by having, having been in, you know, being, you know, I guess, invested in these, these events, like, for example, the Rittenhouse trial, you're much, because you're so invested, you know, you're much more engaged with what's going on, what's in front of you. And you're, you're really, really, really um, just trying to learn and get the, get the best understanding of what's going on. So that way you can give your best honest assessment from, yeah. from all that. So um, that's really cool. Um, so I want to, I want to switch gears here, have, have a little fun with you, Kurt, because I know we're talking about a lot of stuff. I'm sure you want to, don't want to talk about. Um, I like fun. Yeah, I know you do. I know you do. That's, that's part of the reason why I'm doing this um so all right here so being that you are uncivil law one of your monikers or, one, or i guess part of your moniker is the cowboy hat yes. um and being that you love trivia i'm gonna try to see if if i can see, see how 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 good you are with respect to to western so what, what i've done here is i've curated 10 specific i, I guess um shots from from popular western films and I'm going to see uh, if you're able to identify all of these. So give me this just is, one This second. is not going to go well for me, but we'll give it a shot. Okay, good. Maybe, maybe, maybe you'll learn something. Maybe, to be perfectly fair, I'm not like the uh, most fully versed with, uh, with Westerns. So give me one sec here. Let me uh, screen share. There we go. Okay. Give me one sec here. Okay. All right. Here we go. Can you see my screen? Yes. Is All this right. Good, bad and ugly. Yes, it is. This is definitely Yay. the good, the bad. Yeah, it's such a great film. Um, I I don't know how you can enjoy westerns without enjoying Clinic Me being in a good number of those westerns. So yeah, that's the good, the bad, the ugly. Okay, next one right here. All right, this one's a little bit tougher, a little more obscure. Is it Deadwood? No, this is not Deadwood. Is Do you want a hint? What's that? Is it Torchwood? No, no. No, I got it. No, what is it? Uh, this is actually from the Un Unforgiven. Or Unforgiven. Okay, that, that I was not coming up with. Okay. There you go. Unforgiven. Okay. All right, here we go. I do not know this one at all. I okay. don't think I've ever seen this. Okay. This is actually The Revenant. Okay, I've definitely never seen that. Oh, you haven't seen The Revenant? No. Okay, it's beautifully shot I, I, at a minimum. At a minimum. It's, it's really good, though. Okay, here we go. Is this Tombstone? No, this is not Tombstone. No. What is it? <laughs> this is She Wore a Yellow Ribbon. Okay, well, he's wearing a yellow ribbon, but fine. <laughs> that's actually, that's actually, that was actually, actually the, the cavalry colors right there. So the yellow is a is, uh, color for cavalry. So Okay. Um, All righty. Next one. Oh, that's Dancing with Wolves. That one I know. Yeah, 
That's correct. Dance it's a, little a strange wolf. movie, though. Uh, let me ask you as an army officer. This will be a good question for you. So in Dancing with Wolves, the, the titular character goes to his uh, commanding officer, who in about 10 seconds is going to wind up killing himself, but whatever. And he, he dispatches him to the middle of absolutely nowhere. Yeah. So he gets, he gets to his station, to the absolute middle of nowhere. And he he orders the 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 driver to unload the stuff because it's his station. Now I don't know how it works in the military because my impulse would be like you know I don't think my orders really were contemplating the scenario. Right. So my first impulse would be let me go back and report and see if this is really what they want because this does not seem to be is that is that what would you do as an army officer in that situation? You're giving the order to this outpost. The outpost is abandoned. What do you do? uh if it's abandoned i mean it, it really depends is it is the expectation that it's not abandoned well yeah that was the that was the expectation in the film right that was the expectation right. that, that that this post existed right so i'm like yeah this is not really what was contemplated yeah i would definitely go back and and double check to say hey by the way this this outpost that you said that was supposed to be manned it's currently not. Ab abandoned yeah um there's that that's so I probably... thought that, I thought that decision from him was like, well, this is my post, this is my orders, unload the stuff. Also, he's doing it at gunpoint to the guy, which seemed off. Right. I, I that seemed like a weird decision to my mind. Right. Um, yes, to me, that is like a major red flag where it's like if 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 there's and if you're like, hey, you're gonna have all these resources, and all of a sudden you don't have any uh, a single lick of those resources. Yeah, that's yeah. definitely they clearly gave me provisions for a thing that's occupied. Yes. It is clearly not occupied. Yes. So, yeah, uh, reevaluate seems like the, the right course of action here. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, good job, Dancing with Wolves. Next one. Okay. Uh, uh, fistful of dollars? No. This one no. is The Outlaw Josie Wales. No, I got nothing on that one. Oh my goodness. I, I strongly recommend that. The, 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 okay, this exchange, I, I think you might appreciate the exchange between these two. Um, it's between him and Ten Bear. Um, it's, it's a really, really, really good um, scene where they're just um, talking through. I, I try to remember what it was. I remember how I felt when I watched it. Um, but I recommend this. Strongly recommend the outlaw Josie Wales. Okay, yep. And that's a great poster too. Um, here we go. I mean, I've seen this meme a thousand <laughs> times. Uh, do I know the name of the movie it's from? <clears throat> Damn it. <laughs> I'm have okay, I'll be perfectly honest. I'm having fun that I've exposed this as a, as a major blind spot with you. And, um, <laughs> um, okay. Because I'm gonna have fun with this in the future, um, in a good way, of course. Um, this is actually Django and Jane. Okay, yeah. All right, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Um, there we go. And then let's see here. Okay. No, I got nothing. Nothing. Okay. This is Ben Foster playing Charlie Prince in Three Ten to Yuma. Okay, I've heard good things. Three Ten is another great film. All right, here we go. I have a feeling you'll know this one. No? Nothing? I know you've got some pop culture, like this, this lurking in that, in that big brain of yours. There's a band on a buffalo. I could do the band on a buffalo song. <laughs> the on a buffalo. buffalo. Yeah, that's, oh, that's amazing. Um, nothing? No. This is that famous scene from Blazing Saddles? With Mungo? Uh, I've never actually seen Blazing Saddles. We made, really? Yeah, I know. I've never seen Blazing Saddles. That's incredible. Okay, yeah. that's sh that should be on your to-do list for this for uh, next time you watch a movie. Oh my goodness, the, um, that movie might get. Be, it, it's just. Uh, it, it's. I, I, I. If someone tried to make Blazing Saddles today, they might get canceled. I'll just put it that way. Um, well, that's true for a lot of Mel Brooks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, here we go. This is pretty obscure. Nothing. No, okay, no. this is Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. Okay. This is, this is a famous scene in the movie. Robert where, Redford? Yep, Robert Redford and mm -hmm. um, what's his face? Paul I Newman. like Robert Redford. I yeah. Shot. Yeah. Interesting. So Paul yeah, that, Newman? Really? Yeah. No, this is actually a really, really great film. I, I strongly recommend it. This is another great Western. Yeah, I, I basically recommend every single one of these films that, that's, that I just showed you here today. Um, all, all really good. 
I, it's a funny story. I actually watched uh, for the first time ever. She wore a yellow ribbon. I mean, this is me, you know, a little about myself. Um, I actually watched that while I was deployed to Iraq. Uh, mm-hmm. We watched that as like a unit, like because we had like movie nights every Thursday night. This is the film we watched because I was watching a lot of like military themed movies. Ah, uh, sometimes, sometimes what's um, not always, but sometimes when like that, if you want to be like, oh, we're getting the spirit of like, because I was assigned to uh, third ACR out okay. of um, out of Fort Hood, Texas. I think it's now called third CR or um, and basically third that cavalry. Reconnaissance? Uh, that's part of what they do, because that, that, that's a huge part of, of, of cavalry, actually. A cavalry units is they have like a, a, recon- a huge um reconnaissance element to what they do to be able to find out what's going on and um and it's that's essential with what they're with the, how they're designed but yeah there's um the way third third acr was designed because it was, it was a mechanized unit they, they had they had tanks they, they had bradley's they had but there's also a, squ- a squadron it, it was really unique and, and i think this is still the case today but they had um a, um an aviation squadron of like apache helicopters Okay. And it's it's not it's not very often that you find a unit where they actually have an aviation squadron attached to like a mechanized you know unit or, um um unit like like Bradleys and, and and Abrams and stuff like that or even like any like an infantry you know they don't, they they typically do not have an or, um you know it, it, any type of aviation assets organically applied to their um to to what they do. It so. seems like a rational thing to do, but what do I know? Yeah, yeah. I think there's a there's a decentralized element to the army. They like to um that they that they want to maintain. So that's that's why it is the way it is. Okay. Um well cool. Um well, well Kurt, this has been very engaging. I really appreciate the time you gave you know, to ch- kind of like you know shed some light on on how you came to be in civil law more or less, like what, what it is you um came came to do. Um I want to ask you for obviously like your 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 social t- your social media tags so people can find you. But is there, do you have any any final thoughts before before we part ways here today? Uh, I just I really think that one of the wonderful things about YouTube in general is that it, it creates it, for me personally it's created a space for me to talk about something I love. Mm-hmm. Uh, as you might be able to appreciate, there's not a lot of places I can go in the real world, and you <laughs> might you might or might not be surprised. But even in like lawyer associations, in a lot of ways, people don't really like talking about this much as much as you might think. Mm-hmm. It's it's hard to find people to really geek out about this stuff. Yeah. And they'd be like, oh man, did you see that latest decision? It's on fire. Yeah. And you know, yeah. not a lot of lot, not a lot of right. rooms, uh, not a lot of places where you can go watch the big game. Oh, snap, did you see that play? So oh, yeah, uh, yeah, one, yeah. Of the, one of the wonderful things about the entire thing is it's given a space for me to have that experience and for me to geek out about other people who also want to geek out for sure. And also to get an audience of people who enjoy learning and all the rest of it. So I've, I really hope this will continue to be a thing. And if we don't have law con at some point in the very near future, I'm going to be a sad Panda. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, given the, 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 the number of lawyers I've seen emerge, uh, just on law two, but it, itself, um, and this is maybe a question for a later date. It's just, it's just really astounding just to see, um, like, for example, like you, cause it, it's kind of goes back to what I was saying about information feudalism, but basically you have people who, you know, look at the corporate outlets, but then you have these lawyers who are watching these legal proceedings who are finding, you're actually providing, um, analysis based upon, you know, the education that you're given that like what's in your tool chest that, that a lot of these journalists don't have. It's just mm-hmm. sort of like you have journalists, you know, these, these corporate journalists, and then you have these law tubers. Like, who do you listen to um, when it comes down to what's actually happening in, in, in the court of law? And I, I find I find this this dichotomy to be really interesting, and it's gonna be it's I, it's gonna be even more interesting as time progresses. I think so. Absolutely, for sure. Uh, and then Kurt, um, while while we're here, you know, before we part, like I said, before we part ways, where where can people find you? Well, so principally on YouTube, it's on Civil Law. Find me on locals on civil law dot locals dot com, Patreon dot com slash on civil law, and Twitter for on civil law as well are the principal places that people can find me. Also, I have a Discord, and the link for my Discord is in the description of basically every video ever. So you can check that out as a way to hang out with me and other people who are interested in this stuff. So check all those things out for sure. Awesome, Kurt. Thank you so much for stopping by. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, so be sure to to like and subscribe to his videos, and uh, give him a shout. And uh, 
by, by all means he does he does live streams periodically so he's very engaging with the super chat so by all means you know be sure to participate with that as well all right thanks everyone thank you